and a, a good friend. He is a very accomplished uh, senior uh, executive uh, with uh, Big Pharma, as well as very successful in the startup space. So John's worked with a number of biotechs um, over the years, have been attractive to uh, institutional investors, like uh, many of you are participating in this conference. Uh, John's going to mainly talk today about Stingray Therapeutics. Uh, he started Stingray in 2016, and we've been counsel uh, to Stingray uh, since the beginning. Uh, in terms of John's background, he uh, earned his MBA from Wharton in finance. Uh, he then spent 28 years at Eli Lilly, about half of that in corporate uh, biz dev, uh, where he was a senior VP of that department. And in that role at Lilly, he was essentially doing, you know, buy side deals of companies like Stingray and other uh, companies that were uh, uh, venture capital backed and growing and that Lilly wanted to add to their portfolio. Uh, John also spent six years in Asia running the VC arm of Jubilant Life Sciences, which is a large India CRO located in New Delhi and Bangalore. Uh, John uh, then worked for uh, three different biotech companies and now is primarily involved with Stingray. Uh, lastly, John is an accomplished author and he was a contributor to the business of healthcare innovation uh, published by the Cambridge University Press. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Well, thank you so much, Rob, and, and thank you, Marty. It's great, great to be here and talking to the group. Um, let me get right into it. Hope you can see my screen. If you can't, Marty has the presentation and can get it out to you, it's available. Um, my passion and our team's passion is to bring better therapies to cancer patients. And I'm here to talk to you today about Stingray Therapeutics which is targeting innate immunity and bringing forward the next revolution in immune oncology. I hope you might join me in this incredible and potentially highly lucrative effort. We have two innovations in our company. First, the next generation oral cancer drug, which we believe will be broadly important in cancer therapy. And second, a business model which returns to investors in three to four years, not the idea the medicine cabinet 12 to 14 years pharma companies are known for. We can do this because we've already done six years of work to get a great molecule, most of our regulatory work, and we just have really the phase one and two clinical studies ahead. This is where pharma companies buy and we want to sell. I'm an expert in this business with almost 30 years in pharma on the buy side and now 10 years in biotech with this being my third successful company going forward. Let's talk a little bit about the area we're in and the problem. Today's solid tumor immunotherapy cancer drugs are checkpoint inhibitors. Now to understand the problem that they have, let me first explain how today's immune therapies work. Everything available today works in only one arm of the immune system, adaptive immunity. This is the T cells and the antibodies to fight the specific cancer in the body. They enter the tumor and tear it apart from the inside. This is the first punch. But cancers are very smart. They make large amounts of so-called checkpoints. Think of these checkpoints as border crossings, refusing to let T cells cross into the tumor. So our first generation drugs are checkpoint inhibitors, which take down these suppressive checkpoints so T cells can get into the tumor and fight again. These drugs have had a big impact in extending life, but they don't work in many cancers. Cancer punches back. Well, how can this be fixed? Well, the key problem is that our immune system is two-fisted. The other arm is innate immunity. When innate immunity does not function, checkpoint inhibitors cannot work. Turning on innate immunity is the needed next punch. So checkpoint inhibitors can work in the other half of all cancers where they do not work today. Like checkpoints in adaptive immunity, Cancers suppress innate immunity by making a lot of ENPP1. This is the only known direct negative innate immune checkpoint. ENPP1 stops innate immunity, 
Our drug blocks the NPP1 and lowers this innate immune checkpoint. So innate immunity joins adaptive in the fight and T cells can rip into the tumor and tear it up again. By using our ENPP1 inhibitor with checkpoint inhibitors, we can make immune cancer drugs work in far more tumors than they do today. Now, a sea change happened in our wheelhouse with this publication out of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Cornell Medical at the beginning of last year. We have known since 2016 when we started our company that our target, inhibiting ENPP1, was the way to go to make the next big leap in immune oncology therapies. And we were the first company to start an ENPP1 inhibitor program for immune oncology. Now, the leading cancer centers in the world agree with us. Let me show you just a little bit of science. On the left, we see ENPP1 levels increase as the tissue becomes more cancerous, staining in brown for ENPP1. And on the right, we see when ENPP1 is low, the top two panels, CD8 T cells can infiltrate the tumor and work to kill it. But in the bottom, with high ENPP1 levels, T cells are blocked from infiltration of the tumor. They can't get in. Here, we're using a gene knockout in an animal model as a surrogate for using a blocking drug. Double checkpoint inhibitor in red does not stop this 4T1 mouse tumor, but take out the ENPP1 gene so there is no ENPP1 as well in blue, and you flatline the tumor and make checkpoint inhibitor work. Here, we're doing it in two tumors in a completely human system in the test tube. In breast model and ovarian model, we show again with double checkpoint inhibitor we kill the tumor and, and stop it from going forward. Here is a single agent model uh, in an animal model, and it shows that our compound working by itself and showing about 60% tumor reduction. We don't plan to use the drug as a single agent as very few cancer drugs are used in this way, but I wanted to show you that we do have efficacy as a single agent. Here is using our drug in another mouse model with our inhibitor plus checkpoint inhibitor in purple. Again, giving best performance on the left. On the right, we're looking at the 12 individual mice in that purple arm, and we're showing that more than half are on their way to a complete cure when the experiment was stopped. So this is the experiment we want to do in human beings in the clinic. Here you can see some of the tumor types that respond very poorly to checkpoint inhibition and also have very high levels of ENPP1. The individual abbreviations are a little hard to read, so they're called out on the right. But you can see on the x-axis log ENPP1 expression from three logs to 12 logs. Nine logs is a billion overexpression of ENPP1 in the tumor. And on the y-axis is the response rate of using a checkpoint inhibitor in this disease. And these are all cellar dweller diseases because a good response rate for checkpoint inhibitor is melanoma where the response rate is 85%. Here we're looking at zero to 25%. So this is a perfect set of cancers to use for our clinical trial, and we've picked three, breast, renal, and ovarian. This is the clinical trial that we want to do, where we have to do three cohorts of in phase one as a single agent under FDA guidance. Then we move very quickly to in combo with checkpoint inhibitor. We know our dose, so then we can move immediately into the phase two portion. And after the phase two portion, where we expect to move about an average 15% response rate with checkpoint inhibitor alone to greater than 50% response rate with checkpoint inhibitor plus ENPP1 inhibitor, 
will be in a good position for sale to pharma, who will then go on to do the phase two registrational study that can be just 200 patients. And we think we'll be able to get a registration just in all ENPP1 high tumors, which will cover a huge number of tumors with one clinical trial. Our development plan is that we only have a few studies left to do to file our IND. That's permission to start clinical studies in patients. And we know our toxicology now, and we cannot hurt an animal with ENPP1 inhibition in the 28-day studies required. We have seven patents filed, strong intellectual property, and three different scaffolds, all of which have vibrant ENPP1 inhibitors. Like with any truly exciting program, there is competition. Stingray is neck and neck with riboscience that have a poorly absorbed compound that is going to be difficult as a therapeutic. We have the superior compound. Abvi bought the Mavu Pharma program, and this shows pharma is interested in the pathway. Unfortunately for Abvi, they bought the wrong program, and this has been de-resourced out of their pipeline. Pharma usually buys the top three to five programs in the space, and we do have interest. We're the next program up and well ahead of most of the others. These are the buyers and sellers of programs in our space, the same exit we plan for. This is just a straight average of recent exits in our space, and these are precedents for the deal we are after. As you can see, the returns have been very lucrative. Consider investing in our financing now into our Series A Preferred. It is open now and will close this year. Previously, we've raised $4.5 million. This is a preferred security at a $19 million pre-money. It'll be used for our IND, Investigational New Drug Acceptance, and our Phase 1. Uh, this is the team. You can see very experienced group of folks. Sunil Sharma, my partner, is an extremely experienced research clinical oncologist who's done over 150 phase one, phase two clinical trials in oncology as primary investigator. And he's worked for all the major cancer companies and biotechs. So in conclusion, I hope you'll consider the program. This is a major impact drug that we believe will change many lives. You'll do a lot of good by investing in this program. Join a proven team that's repeating their business model for the third time and join a program that's in the lead. Thank you very much for your attention and we have time for questions if we anyone has time. any. John, that was a very efficient presentation. Uh, so we have lots of time for questions. Can you go back a couple of slides? Um, you were talking about uh, likely acquirers. Uh, yes, basically, um, these are the deals that have been done in the space. And there are very few uh, big pharma companies that are not deeply in oncology and deeply in immune oncology. And so if, if you look at the checkpoint inhibitor space, since this is a companion drug to checkpoint inhibitors, almost every major company and every biotech has a checkpoint inhibitor in development, if not on the market. There are about 60 in development. So that's 60 companies, all of which who are looking at a way to differentiate their product in a crowded space. And one of the best ways to do that would be to combine it with the Stingray product. So, so uh, this is a treatment for uh, hard tumors? This is a treatment for solid tumors. So probably not so much for hematologic tumors, except that, and I didn't have time to touch on this, but with CAR-T cellular therapy, where you basically modify the T cell so that it attacks tumors, 
These therapies are trying to come into solid tumors. They're only now effective in blood tumors. And if you're going to be in solid tumors with a CAR T therapy, you need an activator of the immune system in innate immunity. So you need a drug like our EMPP1 inhibitor as well. Oh, it's very interesting. You have a question? Yeah. I was curious with his experience, uh, what percentage of people that are investing in this is more philanthropic, you know, driven versus investment driven? Because I think you can play both fields here. Right, know. right. Yeah. So the question is, what's the division of investors between philanthropy and uh, invest, you know, investment managers? We do have three investors who are primarily venture philanthropy. We have Springhood Ventures out of Boston, who is very interested in the program for childhood solid tumors, such as brain cancers like glioblastoma and medulloblastoma. These are all cancers that secrete a lot of ENPP1 and are very, very difficult to treat and where checkpoint inhibitors don't work. We also have Catalyst Ventures and uh, the Cure Medulo Group or the Carson Leslie Foundation in Dallas, who've invested in the company for this reason. Great. Um, so, and, and what's your timing, in, you know, in terms of liquidity? Are you looking, so, I mean, you mentioned that all these, so, so one of the things that's happening in the uh, healthcare space, obviously, is a lot of uh, pharmaceutical-oriented companies are exiting earlier, right? So, so what do you see as your time frame? Well, uh, we really think that we'll be exiting sometime during the phase two program. We don't think we'll have to wait till the end based on the data that we expect. We think it'll be pretty remarkable even in the phase one setting. So we think three to four years is an appropriate timeline for investors. There have been competitive efforts in this program, not ENPP1 inhibition, but trying to directly agonize the pathway that we're working in. And these, these programs have pretty universally failed. And so most pharma companies are telling us they're very interested, but they do want to see some human data to buy. So, and your likely exit is, is uh, acquisition. Yes, yes. We, that's what we're targeted for. There are lots of possible exits. We do look at other exits, but essentially, we want to get a fast exit and a good exit for our investors. And most investors want to see an exit in that kind of time frame. You talked about how this works in combination with CAR-T therapy. Can you give us um, like a, a general overview of how many, so I, I, I'm aware there's a lot of these uh, blood CAR-T therapies out there, uh, but how many active testings are there on hard tumors or CAR-T therapy? Because I think it's a pretty big number. Yeah, it is a big number. There are, about, there are about 90 companies that are actively working on solid tumors with CAR-T therapies and uh, working there. And uh, there are some very big players uh, and some smaller companies. And uh, they're having uh, some challenging times with that. There are a lot of problems that need to get solved, but they are making good progress. But one thing is obvious is that one of the big issues with CAR T therapies in solid tumors that is not a problem with blood tumors is penetration into the depth of the tumor because the solid tumor develops as a sphere and getting into the center of that sphere is very tough. And so that's where they really need immune, uh, the uh, innate immune system turned on so they can persistently attack and persistently uh, eradicate that solid tumor. And that's not a problem that they have with blood tumors. Fantastic. Um, I'm not sure, is it, maybe there's a couple of questions on chat. Let me just check. Uh, not right now. Um, oh, another question. What's your investment size, particularly minimum investment? What's, what's your tip? What's your investment size, minimum versus you know average? Yeah, you know we've had quite a diverse set of investors, and we do take checks down to twenty five thousand dollars, 
And we've had investors put in a mu as much as a million and a quarter into the company. Right, I think the immunological approach towards uh, cancer therapy has been something that our group has paid attention to over the years. So it's very interesting. How many, so you just give us a kind of a generic number of like how many companies that you started since leaving Eli Lilly and how many have you exited successfully? Yeah, so I've started three companies and uh, two are still moving forward toward their exit, but having some success. The first company I started that I also started with Wilson Sonsini is called Iterion Therapeutics. And it was taken over in the Series A by Sante Ventures there in Austin. Uh, it's doing very, very well. Uh, Sante has moved a little bit slower than I might have if I were still running the company, but uh, doing very well. And uh, they're looking for an exit end of this year. And most of the investors are in Texas or outside of Texas for the for what you guys are doing? We do have a broad following in Texas, but we also have a number of investors on the West Coast and on the East Coast. And, this, and I'm sorry, can you go to the raise, the size of the raise screen again? Yeah, uh, let me get that up. Um, it was two million. So it's a $5 million raise. Let me get to the right slide here. Five million on a, what kind of valuation? Uh, $19 million pre-money. Uh, and uh, basically we've completely de-risked our um, investigational new drug filing with the uh, work that we've done. We know exactly what our tox profile is uh, because we've done extensive tolerability work. So it's just the work to get the final studies in, to get the IND which is basically we have to complete our dog toxicology and tablet our product. And then immediately we can start our phase one. So the $5 million will go to completing our IND studies and getting the, the phase one uh, done. And then we have one more raise before exit and that's probably a $10 million raise to be able to complete the phase two if we need to do it. And what, you're based in Houston? We have been based in Houston, but we recently moved to Dallas uh, at the end of the year uh, because we have a stronger investor base in Dallas. Sure, yeah, it's intriguing, I love Dallas. Um, great, uh, any other questions? Well, this well, is Mark, John. yep. Thank you very much, Marty. Really appreciate it and have the opportunity to talk to so many uh, potential investors. And I would just say, you know, biotech isn't where all your portfolio should be, but if you put a tail end of it in biotech, it's incredible how it can juice the portfolio with the kind of returns we're able to deliver.